Father, thank you for today and the worship. Thank you for just refreshing upon your people because we need it. Lord, there are times it's not about us doing, but it's about you being. You're the king. And if you showed us the way in which we ought go, ought we not just be as well? I'm so sorry, Lord, when we get caught up. Lord, forgive us. Open your word to those who would hear. Father, continue keeping us in the place where sobriety is because eternity is a, is a footstep help us oh God to never lose the burden of the Lord in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen. Um, do you know where my Bible went to? <coughs> I may have left it in our bedroom um, thank you guys for joining us. Um, we uh, normally tape if we ever have anything to say. We tape it um, because we have people that are sort of scattered across the nation who listen in. Um, so people, I guess, the Lord has collected along the way. <laughs> um, this uh, this past week, I was heading to a doctor's appointment. Um, most of you know, guys know that I have a brain tumor that I'm uh, struggling with right now, and so I've had a lot of testing done. And I had one more set. I used to be very noisy today. Uh, one more set of tests done this week, and I have always asked. Um, the Lord to allow me to be a light in the different places that I've gone, um, figuring that I wouldn't normally have an opportunity to uh, see that particular set of people if it weren't. Can you get him, honey, please? And um, I, I just I wouldn't be able to talk to these people, so I figured um, it's like a little missionary trip talking to these different ones and um, I've been very concerned about whether or not I'm an accurate light for the Lord. Like am I really being who I'm supposed to be? Am I being honest and 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 not hiding my light? I don't know. It's just been a thought that I've had. And so many times I feel deficient. Timmy. Guys, you're going to have to get him and hold him because right now he's very excited. So, uh, anyway, as I was driving home this past time, um, the Lord really hit me about um, this idea of being the light. And, and specifically in the section in the scriptures where it talks about the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. And um, so, a couple of different verses here. In the in the Sermon on the Mount, after the Beatitudes, right right after that area, um, Jesus says to uh, let your light shine before man. Stick it on a you know, nobody hides it under a, a bushel or under a box or whatever. We put the light out where it can be seen, where it can be understood and recognized. And um, that hit me because it's not a the flame itself doesn't change. If you put it under a box or under a bushel or probably a woven basket in those days, um, the flame doesn't change, whether it's out on a candlestick or whether it's inside. And the Lord is just saying to me, this is like you. I mean, when I made you into a new creature and I gave you 
a new spirit and a new heart that was able to receive me and my love. You became a, a, a flame for me. And whether you cover it up with a basket or a box, or you sit it on top of a pillar so that it can shine for everybody, the flame is the same. When I've done that work, it is, you are what you are. You and your substance are who you are, and it doesn't change. You're still a fire. But you can hide that flame under the stuff that you surround yourself with, and, and quite honestly, to protect yourself. And then people don't see that light. And I love the picture the apostles use, Paul uses, of us being cracked pots. The more cracks we have, the more the light gets out, <laughs> you know? Uh, we are we are fragile vessels, but we are so desperate to hold it all together and to really put up these defenses around the walls of our heart. And when we do that, the light can't spill out. The light can't spill out of us if we guard ourselves and, and try to act like we got it all together. It is in our vulnerability and our suffering that that's when that light shines forth. And so I've been just like meditating on this. What, what does that mean? As I'm walking around in places that I go, if I put on my happy face and say everything's all right, even though I've got stuff going on in my life, and I don't allow people to see not just the suffering. Not, it's not like a pity party of like, oh, I've got all this junk going on in my life. I've got sickness and I've got kids and I've got, you know, struggles with work and I've got this and that and the other. It's not just like unloading that, but allowing the Lord to minister to me his love and then sharing how his love is working through those situations. And yeah, not denying the hard parts, but also receiving the truth, speaking the truth to myself, and then allowing that to fill me up as Christ comes and nourishes me. And then that overflows its banks and it goes out onto all the other people that are around me. And it gives hope to those who are also struggling in their own lives, who maybe still have their defenses up, who are still afraid of allowing vulnerability and brokenness mm -hmm. and as we share that particularly as the body of christ particularly as we share our sufferings with one another and with christ we establish a community that's tight-knit and we know that there's a safety that's there because there's a love that's shared and um i think this is all wrapped into us being lights together so that we can be a, maybe a capital light for mm -hmm. christ you know, a capital L light, uh, as the body functioning with him, um, as hands and feet. You know, the broken know best how to minister to the broken. And um, I think sometimes I am unapproachable because of the defenses that I put up. Very active today. Uh, so <laughs> they are. Lots of light. Lots of light. So uh, that was one part of it. But the other part really had to do with um, a, a struggle that I've had for a long time. And that's about performance. You know, we were born into this world and um, the rules of this world are basically, if you do and you achieve, then you're worth something. The performance is that pretty much all that matters in whatever realm you're in. And so you have to do the best, look the best, be the best in order to be worth some value. And it's the kingdom of this world. And it even seeps into our religious spheres where, you know, you have the most people come to your meetings. You have the best voices. You have the best programs um, or whatever it is. And then you're worth something. We could say, oh, God has blessed you. And that's the way we tend to value it in, in, in our society. But it's just not true. That's not God's kingdom. That's this earth's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And his kingdom is about heart and love and suffering and servitude because that's what he came to do. He didn't come to rule over us, but to serve us and to win us through his, his deep love and passion for us 
And the word passion itself comes from the root to suffer. And, and so when we are with passion, compassion is what, you know, with passion, we are with suffering, walking through this world, realizing this isn't our home, this, we're just passing through here, and we are reaching out to other people who are um, poor and blind and in need of hope. And as we do that, we collect souls. What an incredible thing. I mean, not for us. But for the Lord, we reach out and we touch souls, and some are saved. Some who will who who hear the word of God and receive it, they accept it, and they they come along, and it's just another soul who can enjoy the glories of the Lord, and we get to be a part of that whole process, literally an extension of what Christ did when He came down onto the earth with the same exact mission to come and draw people to the Father, and so we are with passion or in. Walking in compassion, uh, in the strictest sense of the word, as we follow out in the footsteps of the Messiah. But I've always struggled with, well, I don't have this great, like, ministry. I'm just a mom. And I just, uh, you know, I just do my thing. I don't have much impact on anyone except for my kids. <laughs> and um, feeling a little bad about that. And once again, going back to the light. It's like, well, maybe my light's just not quite right. Maybe it's not burning big enough or on display enough or whatever. And the Lord uh, gave me sort of a picture. Um, and it goes back to this parable of the virgins, really. Um, this is uh, the, Matthew 25. At the time my coming draws near, the heaven's kingdom realm can be compared to ten maidens who took their oil lamps and they went outside to meet the bridegroom and his bride. And five of them were foolish and ill-prepared, for they had no extra oil for their lamps. And five of them were wise and sensible, for they took flasks of olive oil with their lamps. And when the bridegroom didn't come, when they expected, they all grew drowsy and fell asleep. And then suddenly, in the middle of the night, they were awakened with the shout, Get up! The bridegroom is here. Come out and have an encounter with him. So all the girls got up and they trimmed their lamps. But the foolish ones were running out of oil. So they said to the five wise ones, Share with us your oil, because your lamps are in, our lamps are going out. We can't, they replied. We don't have enough for all of us. You'll have to go and buy some for yourselves. So while the five girls were out buying oil, the bridegroom appeared, and those who were ready and waiting were escorted inside with him and the wedding party to enjoy the feast, and then the door was locked. Later, the foolish girls came running up to the door, and they pleaded, Lord, Lord, let us come in. But he called back, go away. I don't know you. I can't assure you. I don't even know you. That is the reason you should always stay awake and alert, because you don't know the day or the hour when your bridegroom will appear. And um, so this section is really dealing with being ready for the appearing of Christ. And um, I've always thought, I grew up in a Baptist background, so I always thought that was like the, the rapture, you know, <laughs> that's when, that's it. Um, but I, I think now more that it's not just that. I think God appears to us all the time through our lives. And there's different moments of appearing when he's just ready to reveal another section of him to us. But we have to be looking for him. We have to have our eyes on him, or we could miss what he wants to share with us in that moment, in, in that situation, in that circumstance. And so, yeah, there may be a very big appearing, you know, when he comes uh, with a capital A, but there's lots of little appearings all throughout our life as he reveals more and more intimately his um, himself to us, his heart to us. So keeps the relationship fresh. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> exactly. And, and I don't want to be asleep for that. Mm -mm. I don't want to be asleep for that. And so I've, I've often thought about these virgins, and, you know, there's five of them who were sleepy, or, well, all of them were sleepy. Um, but five heard the, the call. They were ready to go. They had the extra oil. They were, they were on their way. And we think of oil, and... Um, I had always thought of oil as being like the spirit, you know, they had the spirit and the other ones didn't. So, you know, they had to go out and get spirit. Um, but as we, uh, I was just sort of in dialogue with the Lord about this, oil is spirit. Um, they had a relationship with the bridegroom. They had an invitation to go 
to that that wedding feast but they but they didn't have something they didn't have something that they needed to see they didn't they didn't they were in the darkness with not quite enough oil they had some oil but they didn't have enough to get them to where they needed to go I said lord what is that and he reminded me of um gethsemane actually gethsemane in in hebrew uh means the oil press it's a place it was a grove of oils and they had a big press there where they would squish the oils and they would cause the oil to come out of, of the uh of the olives i guess and out of that fruit and then the oil was used for whatever purpose oftentimes lighting lamps or um, cosmetics or whatever but it was a, a place of pressing it was very fitting for the the place where christ was under tremendous emotional stress before going to the cross it was a place of pressing that turmoil inside of him where he sweat blood drops uh for us and it is in those circumstances of life that press us hard that that fruit of the spirit that god has cultivated within us gets pressed hard and the sweet oil comes out and that's what lights our way it's that darkness that surrounds us and yet we hold fast to the lord and we know that he is pressing us to produce pure oil for him and that's the fuel for the light mm -hmm. to shine it's it's that oil that's so necessary and you see you can't you can't just hurry up and get it at the last second you know when god calls you you can't just go and build up some experience experience is built day after day after day after day and 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 that trusting and that writhing as you're waiting upon the lord in fact in many of the psalms where it talks about waiting on the lord it's it's not waiting like put your feet up on on a, a ottoman or something and you know eat a twinkie and wait for the lord that's not it it's 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 like wrestling it's it's i'm not gonna let you go till you bless me kind of thing and and it's that whirling is is wrapped up in that hebraic word is it's to like literally be turning round and round and i will not let you go i know you're going to come through it's that kind of waiting and you can't build that up in a second because you hear the trumpet call and you're going to just hurry up and that's why the the wise versions say i can't give you my oil you gotta go get your own i don't want to let you have it no no that walking through that they have collected that is so precious and it's meaningful it is not in vain the struggles and the sufferings that we go through it isn't mm -hmm. uh, so the lord gave us scripture uh, and uh but before i do that there's a video clip uh it's audio from david wilkerson uh don't know if you've heard of david wilkerson yeah, he's my spiritual father is because of his message anguish that caused me to go into the into ministry to say okay lord i'm all yours and uh it goes along very much with this john chapter 12 verse 23 Jesus replied to them, The hour <clears throat> has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. The one who loves his life will lose it, and the one who hates his life uh, in this world will keep it for eternal life. Anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Um, this is the verse specifically to really take home and masticate on it, chew on it, run it through. Okay, and in this dialogue with the Lord, verse 27, Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that is what, why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So, um, 
going through Ecclesiastes. Um, Father, your word is true. Your word is life. It's meat. Abba, we love you. Jesus, help me to just be faithful, to give what you've given me, to give to those who are hungry, who need you. Lord, here am I, your vessel. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, it's better to be in a house of mourning than in a house of feasting. It's Ecclesiastes 7. Better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, since that is the end of all mankind. The living should take it to heart. Grief is better than laughter. For when a sad, face is sad, a heart may be glad. The heart of wise is in a house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in a house of pleasure. It is better to listen to rebuke from a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. I'm not advocating living ho-hum. I constantly get that misinterpretation. That's not it. God does give us joy. The joy is found in him. I think we get... We really, really, really like this earth. We really like this country. We really like our comfort. We like our conveniences. We like our health. We like the fact that we like to eat certain things. And God says, he reminds us, that's not what you're here for. Paul says to Timothy, endure hardship as a soldier. This is a battlefield. And when someone rebukes you, take it, receive it. Because your flesh is getting in the way of my glory, Jesus says. He says, receive it. Tell him, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I didn't see that. It's, it's uncomfortable to our flesh. We don't like people telling us, giving us rebuke. But the more we seek after the Lord, the more we will recognize our own pride. Anytime you raise a defense or make an excuse, say, Oh, well, no big deal. Even not being able to say, I'm sorry. That's your flesh saying, I don't want to deal with that. But your spirit is crying out, this is what I need. We are spiritual beings. God made us that way. And Jesus says, what shall I say to these things? Save me from this hour? No. Guys, embrace the cross. Embrace the challenges. So I, I shared earlier that I had some stomach issues. I was foolish, and I'm, here's my embarrassment. I'm going to embrace it. I overate on the road, just eat something. I'm hungry, got to go. And my body said, no. And I said, ah, uh, stick. <laughs> but the Lord has been giving me a word throughout this whole time. This is the fast that I choose. Okay. So in an attempt to try to solve this bowel issue, God hit me square in the, square in the eyes. Wait a minute. I'm doing what Jesus said he wouldn't do. Save me from the south. No, he said, no, for this I came. That the Father's glorified. Do you understand that the Father is glorified in your brokenness? That when you don't hide it, I mean, there's a measure of, forgive the language, prostituting your emotions. But by the same token, love is risky. And it's not a gift unless it's fully given. Jesus gave his life. He didn't hold back 5% of it. So once it was dark, he got off the cross. No. He gave his life completely. That's what made it a gift. And he rose from the dead. That's what made that a gift. So, he was open and vulnerable with 
and, and, and it just, it breaks the, breaks my heart being able, seeing, I'm like, oh God, would I be like one of these disciples who ran off when Jesus was being the most human of all, getting whipped and crucified and mocked? You know, the cross was not as much for execution as people think. Flogging was. The cross was in an attempted death by humiliation. We don't like our failures. We don't like to say, going to my bowel issue, I, I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to learn from this? Because my flesh gave up in this area. Then I had the touch of heaven. I want you to see how it fails you. I want you to worship me regardless of pain of the difficulties and struggles. Will you continue? And would you believe it? The pain was mostly gone. I come back out of that time of worship and I do have some pain, but it's a picture. It's all a picture. God, like what Leanne was sharing, we have moments where God is busy trying to keep that relationship with us afresh. But because of anything here on this earth, we're not willing to say, I came for this. Like Jesus said, Father, <clears throat> I came to this hour. Do I, this, what was the hour? It was the hour of pressing, of that oil that comes out. Why should a, Proverbs, why should a fool have money in his hand by wisdom when he has no sense? Those five virgins were foolish. Wisdom, Proverbs 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When, the, when you respond to him in, in your daily circumstance, and you turn when he gives you those reproofs, okay, Lord, now what? That's fearing the Lord. That's wisdom. Those pressings, every time he goes slap right on you, it's not because he's mean. He's actually because he's loving. He's training you for eternity. You have a particular function in eternity with him for his kingdom that can only be gained here. And if we are not grabbing onto that, that eternity experience goes out the window and you... You can ask for a similar experience to come back, but you'll never get get that particular experience back. I was in, in the apprenticeship. Um, I worked with a very difficult guy who was abusive. Pulled, nearly pulled me off 40 feet on a scaffold. And the beautiful story about that was we reconciled, embraced, and I told him I love him. And we were a uh, dear sweet man since then. But So the first couple days... He just uh, yelled, cussed. I mean, demand, I, I was like, I told my general foreman, you got to get me out of this guy. And then quietly, the Lord said, you know, I'm going to bring that back to you. No, I don't want it. He said, and you're going to learn the lesson that I want you to learn. Did you learn to love? And that's what he wanted me to learn. I was with him. Literally three days later, nine months. <laughs> okay, Jesus, you want me to love him. Not knowing, I mean, knowing later, wife had third bout of breast cancer. He had bad knees. He was in his 60s. He hated nights. Nobody would love him. And it wasn't me because Leanne can testify I would come home crying because of the, the sheer abuse. Looking back on it, it was the destruction of my flesh that needed to happen. If I knew then what I know now, I would have said, thank you, Jesus. You are destroying my flesh. You are making me after your image. You didn't shy away from suffering. You embraced it, knowing what was on the other side. Sometimes there are things, I can't get away from this. Okay, Lord, I will walk through. That's what David calls the valley of the shadow of death. What are you afraid of? You're going to go into 
this illusion, death is an illusion, it's a fear tactic, the actual death itself, I, I spoke with someone, I said, if you were in a sawmill, and there was a big old saw blade about this big, and was just decided to, ew, and, and decapitate you, death is done, that moment of death was a, was a split second, you're done, boom. But if it's like hovering, you know, two inches from your neck, you're gonna be like, oh, that's the shadow of death. That is what causes us to flip. But if you say, and and, and it's it's a hard attitude. Okay, I'll walk through this because God is with me, which takes faith. Instead of shying away from suffering, shying away from difficulty. No good thing was done without difficulty. Jesus' death for all of eternity's salvation was difficult. It was not easy. He endured, I mean, loneliness, rejection, scoffing, mocking. If you are a born again uh, Jesus... Oh yeah, you got stuck. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong thing. Our labors, griefs, and sorrows here are for eternal riches, pleasures, and comforts there. We labor for him who bought us. And he shows us how we labor. So that the work we do here will achieve the same effect as the master did. So as he labored, he's, as a carpenter, you know, you see these, these carpenters have been doing it. You know, 20, 30 years, and they're swinging the hammers. They, they, they do these tasks, and they're like, man, that looks gorgeous. And they say, you could do that too. Well, how do I get there? They say, come follow me. Oh! Jesus said, you know, the disciples, Where, where's the path to life? And, and, and Jesus says, follow me. That was what he was telling us. You want the, the path to life? Follow him. And, and the Hebrew, Hebrew thought of it was, you're licking the dust. You are, you are in his stuff. And he was very earthy in the sense of the, the parable of the, um, not the parable, the story where uh, he says, don't you know what you eat goes out into the latrine? Where do you think he may have been talking to them about that? They were going potty, <laughs> probably. Timmy. And... That's, I mean, he was, that object lessons. God wants to speak to you through these object lessons. Through these labors that just cause you to just weep. Just some difficulties that you just say, I can't do this, God. I can't. And he says, I know. He wants you to say, you have my attention. Is it of any wonder why Proverbs says, if you stretch out your ear to me, I will give you the greatest of riches? And I'm not talking about gold and money. I'm not saying that. His presence is better than anything. You put more joy in my heart than they do when they're great and want to balance Psalm 4. So if you're a born again, Jesus blood bought child of God, who you are is labor. It's not what you do. It's who you are. It is your living character. As you stand, walk, be a mom, go to appointments, that speaks like stones. They found uh, uh, scientifically that stones, rocks, boulders, hold on uh, to sound, sound waves. So when God says to Cain, your brother's blood cries from the ground, he wasn't being eloquent. He wasn't being figurative. Um, Jesus says, if these remain silent, the very stones will cry out. There's a reason for that. Memorial stones. Okay? We are living stones. There is a, there is a sound. And what is that sound? It is the words of God that, in, that animate the very presence that is in you from Him. Let's submit. Let's submit. Submit to the difficulties. 
Now, there are things where we are told to be prudent. You know, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. And we always, it's, it's about dialogue. You can't make this a hard and fast rule. It has to be Lord Jesus. Okay, here's what I have here. What do I do? And then walk out in faith. But don't put the cart before the horse. Jesus knew what he was going to do. There was no way around it. And, and God promises that he'll give you that instant knowing this is the way I walk in it. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Psalm, uh, Romans 12. Be fervent in serving. Be patient. Your Lord is coming. These momentary challenges, sufferings, labors. Don't look at suffering as suffering because now we look at it as negative. It's laboring. It's working. It's producing. It's investment. Hallelujah. I mean, that's we. It, it is producing. We are farmers on a field that perhaps will gain a return. So, Father, I thank you for the challenge, Lord, that you would take the world. We would rather have Jesus. Jesus, we love you. I pray that these um, words that were spoken would spark us anew to know how to pour out to others who have no clue who you are. Jesus, grant increase in our labors and in the harvest. Father, fill us with a new song. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to read the lyrics. It's a hymn. So there was somebody who did it, uh, did a version of it uh, in a more worship style that I go in to my shop and I listen and I'm on my face. And Leanne's like, how come you didn't get any, any work done? <laughs> and I come off the floor. Because I'm in tears and weeping because I was in worship. <laughs> but that's where it starts. It's in that closet. It's called Take the World But Give Me, but give me Jesus. And uh, let's see if you can uh, guess who the author is. Take the world but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name. But, but his love abideth ever. Through eternal years the same. The refrain is, oh, the height, of, the height and depth of mercy, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Sweetest comfort of my soul. With my Savior watching o'er me, I can sing the billows roll. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Let me view his constant smile. Then throughout my pilgrim journey, Light will cheer me all the while. Take the world, but give me Jesus. In his cross, my trust shall be. Till with clearer, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord, I see. Fanny Crosby, a blind hymn writer, who could say, to my Jesus, I shall see.